Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, this lecture at the Institute of World Politics. George Washington, the indispensable president, with Stephen Knott. For those of you who are new to IWP, um, we're a grad school of national security and international affairs. If you are interested in learning about us, please feel free to ask one of our staff members following the lecture. Stephen Knott is a professor of national security, uh, security affairs at the United States Naval War College. He served as co-chair of the University of Virginia's Presidential Oral History Program, directed the Ronald Reagan Oral History Project, and also served on the staff of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. Professor Knott received his PhD in political science from Boston College, and he has taught at the United States Air Force Academy and the University of Virginia. He's the author of numerous books, including Rush, <laughs> Rush to Judgment, George W. Bush, The War on Terror and His Critics, Secret and Sanctioned, Covert Operations, and the American Presidency, an, an Examination of the Use of Covert Operations by Early American Presidents, and Alexander Hamilton in The per Persistence of Myth, a book on Alexander Hamilton's controversial image in the American mind. Dr. Knott has also co-authored um, The Reagan Years and At Reagan's Side, Insider's Recollections from Sacramento to the White House. His most recent co-authored volume is Washington and Hamilton, The Alliance That Forged America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Knott. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful day. I know there are other temptations out there for you to... To take advantage of, so I appreciate you coming. Um, I am going to speak to you today about George Washington, um, who uh, you know, yesterday we celebrated President's Day, which I wish would revert back to Washington's birthday, but that's a separate issue perhaps we can deal with later <laughs> questions. I'm not sure George Washington deserves to be on par with Franklin Pierce, but uh, whatever. <laughs> All right, so. He's certainly not Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> uh, so George Washington was inaugurated in New York City on April 30th, 1789. And he was taking the helm of an executive branch with a very uh, nebulous job description. The powers of Article II were not particularly clearly defined in the Constitution. So Washington understood that the precedents that he was setting uh, would shape the American presidency and also shape the, the whole Constitution writ large as long as the American experiment survived. And in fact, Washington was well aware of the sort of burden uh, that he confronted. He wrote to a British historian Less than a year after assuming the office, he, he noted, quote, My station is new, and I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not be hereafter drawn into precedent. Uh, so he was well aware that he was setting or laying down a number of markers for his successors. Washington's inaugural ceremony began at approximately 2 p.m. on the floor of Federal Hall in downtown Manhattan uh, with a nervous president, interestingly enough, taking his oath from Chancellor Robert Livingston. Washington was overcome with emotion upon completing his inaugural address and had a difficult time reading that same address. And while some of the emotion was the result of his understanding the historical importance of the occasion, the president also approached his new, unchartered assignment with a sense of dread. He wrote his old wartime ally, Henry Knox, quote, that his elevation to the presidency was, a, was accompanied with feelings not unlike those of a culprit who was going to his place of execution. <laughs> the new president, as I already mentioned, had little to guide him. Although, along with most prominent Americans, he had read the series of essays that which came to be known as the Federalist Papers. Washington believed that these essays shed new light upon the science of government and were likely to make a lasting impression on those who read Publius's clear and forcible arguments. And he may have found some guidance in these essays as two of the authors, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison were, at least at the time, in Madison's case, political allies. The third author, John Jay, 
had drafted the Constitution for the state of New York, which created a strong chief executive. Hamilton, of course, was the primary author of the essays dealing with the presidency, and while he would never serve as president, his influence on President Washington and on the long-term health of the office was significant. The ability of the nation to coherently conduct war and foreign affairs was deeply felt by George Washington and also by Alexander Hamilton, for they had seen up close and personal the near disastrous results of conducting war by committee. I'm referring to the Articles of Confederation here. The nation's first president would set innumerable precedents that would be cited by his successors to justify presidential leadership in matters of war and national security. Now, Washington's distaste for conducting a war and foreign policy by committee was evident in his failed attempt in August 1789 to solicit the Senate's advice on treaty negotiations with the Creek Indians. The new president believed that this constitutional power to negotiate treaties was shared with the Senate and he met in person with the entire body. As Washington looked on, members of the Senate pontificated for hours and then deferred action on a proposed treaty, leaving Washington in a violent fret, as he put it, and grousing that, quote, this defeats every purpose of my coming here, end quote. So Washington had genuinely sought the advice of the upper chamber but he quickly abandoned that practice after this dismal experience. There is another legacy of Washington's presidency that I think will be of interest to, to this audience in particular. Washington had served as America's first spy master during the Revolutionary War, and he believed that clandestine tools were essential to preserving the nation's security, and he was determined to use them as the first commander-in-chief. The incoming president had, had observed during the Revolutionary War, quote, there are some secrets on the keeping of which depends the salvation of an army, secrets which cannot, at least ought not, to be entrusted to paper, not, but none, which none but the commander-in-chief at the time, excuse me, should be acquainted with. So don't put everything in writing. And there are going to have to be some secrets that even your, your congressional overseers, um, will, you will not share that information with them. Both Washington and Hamilton understood that success in war and in the broader struggle between nations required the use of Machiavellian tactics and the employment of individuals with less than sterling characters. Neither man was essentially, you know, was particularly enamored with these tactics, nor the types of individuals that one had to employ for spying or for covert operations, but they, it, was, it was necessary. In his first annual message to Congress, the president requested a Secret Service fund. The fact that this request was, was included in Washington's first formal communication with the legislature reveals the importance that Washington placed on clandestine activities. The President's request was approved by Congress in 1790, and with it, Washington was granted the authority to avoid the usual reporting procedures mandated by Congress. In other words, the President was essentially given a blank check, in this case amounting to $40,000, to conduct secret operations he deemed to be in the national interest and he never had to report a specific accounting as to just how that money was spent. One of the more controversial actions of George Washington's presidency, and one that continues to excite critics of, not so much of Washington, but of the Federalists and Hamilton in particular, was Washington's suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. Thousands of rebels in Western Pennsylvania defied a federal excise tax on alcohol, armed themselves, and at one point threatened to burn Pittsburgh to the ground. Washington considered the repression of this insurrection as fulfilling his constitutional obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. 
executed. But I have to say that view tends to be dismissed in lore and in legend. Uh, instead, this episode of lawlessness on the part of the whiskey dis distillers and their sympathizers is frequently celebrated by progressive historians as an example of early American democracy in action. The whiskey distillers are portrayed as well-intentioned country folk who stood up to the East Coast establishment um, and sort of uh, gave it to the moneyed interest of New York and Philadelphia. So Washington and Hamilton are kind of the bad guys in this caricature to count of what was in fact one of the early tests of the rule of law. Hamilton, for instance, is often described as itching for a chance to crush this populist uprising. But here again, a thorough, unbiased examination of this event reveals that this is, in my view, Jeffersonian-inspired propaganda masquerading its history. The same principles at stake in the Whiskey Rebellion would be tested some 80 years later during the American Civil War. In other words, does an armed minority have the right to defy laws enacted through constitutionally approved procedures and resist those, those laws through the use of violence? Now, Hamilton's Treasury Department, at Washington's behest, had made concessions to the rebels in the period leading up to the worst outbreak of violence, but this did not appease the distillers. In order to offset the impact of the whiskey tax, Hamilton had directed that the United States Army purchase whiskey from distillers who had obeyed the law and paid the tax. Additionally, as one historian has noted, uh, the residents of western Pennsylvania, where most of this trouble had occurred, contributed almost nothing to the federal treasury while draining it through costly military actions that were taken to protect frontiersmen from the Native Americans on whose land they continually encroached. Additionally, violence against federal agents attempting to collect the tax, to collect the tax was commonplace. In one instance, one of Hamilton's treasury agents was held in a distillery for three days without food and told that he could secure his freedom by, quote, submitting to the mild punishment of having his nose ground off at the grindstone. While Hamilton tends to be the villain in the various progressive portrayals of the Whiskey Rebellion, the fact is that it was President George Washington who authorized the use of force against the rebels and, interestingly enough, even led, for a time, a brief period of time, the 14,000-man force, which Washington cunningly named the Army of the Constitution, that marched into western Pennsylvania. But as is frequently the case in accounts of Washington's presidency, and this is an important point, Hamilton serves as the heavy, as kind of the, the bad influence on a policy that was, in fact, George Washington. The president himself celebrated the demise of the Whiskey Rebels in his sixth State of the Union message to Congress, noting that the uprising su su suppression demonstrates, quote, that our prosperity rests on solid foundations, where the American people were ready to maintain the authority of law, of the law against licentious invasion. Now, Washington went on to shape many other aspects of the American presidency that are taken for granted today. He created the president's cabinet, and his first appointee was Alexander Hamilton, currently of Broadway fame, um, age 34. I used to have to explain who Hamilton was before Lynn Manuel Miranda appeared on the scene. Um, Hamilton was only 34 when he was appointed to the position of Secretary of the Treasury. Joining Hamilton in the cabinet were Washington's faithful subordinate from the war, General Henry Knox, as Secretary of War, and for a time, John Jay, who was the de facto Secretary of State, until Thomas Jefferson returned from France in March 1790. Rounding out the cabinet was the president's lawyer, Edmund Randolph, as the Attorney General. And that's an important point. There's no Department of Justice at this time. The Attorney General did not have a staff. He was pretty much just the President's lawyer. 
One of Washington's most important accomplishments involved his efforts to convince his fellow citizens, as Hamilton had put it in a letter to Washington, to think continentally, to move beyond the parochial, to move beyond the local. And this is at a time, you have to keep in mind, when most Americans seldom journeyed beyond the confines of their birthplace. So this was a hard sell. Uh, as an immigrant, Hamilton never considered himself a citizen of a particular state. He was an American. He was a, a veteran of the Continental Army of the United States of America. Washington, however, considered himself a Virginian. And in my view, his transformation from a somewhat parochial Virginian to a champion of American nationalism is one of the most dramatic facets of his life. He was determined that his fellow citizens follow the same course. Part of this effort to convince his fellow citizens to think continentally involved the seemingly innocuous, innocuous issuance of a Thanksgiving proclamation in October 1789. Again, this may not seem like that big of a deal, but in fact it was. Many members of Congress assumed that this type of a proclamation, in this case Thanksgiving proclamation, would be issued by the various state governors. But Washington, sensing an opportunity to bind the citizenry to the national government and to some extent to the presidency, issued the proclamation himself. And if you read that first Thanksgiving proclamation, you will see that it is filled with references to the new nation and was addressed to, and this is important, to the people of the United States, not to the states. Washington set other precedents as well and left a legacy of respect for the new office of the presidency through what I consider a sort of blend of accessibility but also detachment. Uh, his frequent presidential tours of the nation allowed the people to see their president although always at a distance. Uh, this was not a glad-handing president who pandered to the people and would plunge into the crowd and kiss babies. Uh, Washington would try to win their affection by, it did not try, excuse me, to win their affection by presenting himself as a regular guy. Washington believed that the people wanted to look up to their president and that a certain amount of awe toward the office, even in a republic, was an attribute that contributed to a respectable government. Now, I come from New England, and I grew up in a small town where Washington nearby had visited. And a visit from President Washington was the biggest event to happen in some of these towns, including where I'm from, even to this day. Uh, traveling over nearly impassable roads, and I think we need to appreciate just how grueling these tours were. Uh, the roads were in horrific condition. Uh, but the president would, would travel over these ro roads in a very resplendent uh, coach drawn by six white horses. Uh, he would be inevitably greeted by a welcome, welcoming committee of respectable citizens of the town and he would utter a few inconsequential pieties about the destiny of the new republic. So no policy speeches, no, you know, this is what Congress needs to do. That doesn't come really until the 20th century. All of this, however, served to bind the nation together, and it's important to remember this is a nation in which the citizens of Georgia have about as much in common with the citizens of New Hampshire as they did with the residents of Tasmania. I mean, there simply was no contact whatsoever. And also Washington is attempting to garner respect for this office of the presidency. You know, keep in mind, the American Revolution, in a sense, was a revolution against distant power. Um, and Washington was seen by some of the anti-federalists as kind of a monarchical figure. This is, this is not an easy sell. Washington's tours had the added benefit of clarifying the relationship between the states and the federal government, another relationship which was left somewhat ambiguous under the new Constitution. 
So Washington's first presidential tour was of New England, although Washington pointedly excluded Rhode Island, which had yet to ratify the Constitution. He made a point of going right around the edge, kind of rubbing it in. Uh, the tour lasted from October 15th to November 13th, 1789, so almost a month. Uh, and it included a stop in Boston where the president received a somewhat chilly reception from the governor of the Commonwealth, pardon this expression, the pompous John Hancock. Uh, John Hancock would probably not be known by most Americans had it not been for his oversized signature on the Declaration of Independence. But Hamilton believed, excuse me, Hancock believed that he was the governor of the Bay State and therefore he outranked Washington on Massachusetts soil. And so you had a standoff between the governor of Massachusetts and the visiting president as to who was going to visit the other and pay his respects. Washington, of course, won the standoff. Basically what happened was that Governor Hancock pretended he was sick and Washington was gonna to have to come see him. Uh, Washington refused to do it. All of a sudden, John Hancock recovered from his illness um, after he saw the huge crowds that were greeting the president upon his arrival in Boston. So again, it, it, this may seem you know, small, not particularly significant, but it's, it's helping to sort of draw lines, draw boundaries between, in this case, the states and the federal government. Let me conclude, I'd rather take your questions and keep talking at you. Um, let me conclude by noting that, in my view, George Washington was the indispensable president. I don't see any of this, this being the United States of America, uh, happening without him. That may sound hyperbolic, but I don't see the United States winning the American Revolution, not that he was a great general, but he understood something critical that if he could keep that Continental Army alive and sort of tire the, wear down the British Empire, the so-called glorious cause had a chance, and he understood that. So he was indispensable during the Revolution. He was indispensable in terms of his presence at the Constitutional Convention. You know, his stature lent legitimacy to that event that I just don't see being there. There's no other person from Georgia to New Hampshire, who would have been recognizable or recognized by most Americans. Ben Franklin's a possible exception, but Ben Franklin's in his 80s by the 1790s. He's in no position to assume the presidency. Uh, so Washington is that recognizable name. He's the hero of the revolution. He has street cred, if you will with the man on the street. Um, and he, through, through his presence in the war, in the convention, and then becoming the first president, and it was assumed that he would be the first president, by the way, uh, he lends legitimacy to all of those endeavors. The presidency of sober expectations, this is what I would characterize Washington's presidency. And by that I mean, it's nation building, but it's, it's limited in scope. This is not a president who's promising to remake the lives of the citizenry. Uh, so it's a, it's a presidency that's trying to create a sense of nationhood, but it's not a presidency that's promising the world to its, to, to his, his citizens. So I, re, I refer to Washington's presidency as a presidency of sober, ex, sober expectations. And by the way, I believe Washington's presidency offers something of a model for us, for contemporary Americans to emulate. Washington's presidency possessed enough power to defend the nation from foreign and domestic threats, as we saw with the Whiskey Rebellion. And Washington and Hamilton launched the United States on the path to becoming a superpower. So they clearly had, in my view, plenty of the authority and the power that they needed. But Washington's presidency also acknowledged certain restraints and limitations on the office and on the office holder. Washington served as a unifying head of state who was respect, respectful of the dignity of his office and who refrained from stoking partisan divisions 
and becoming a captive to public opinion, always paying due regard to the Constitution. All of Washington's actions, and you read his defense of his various actions, they're always grounded in the Constitution, not in public opinion, not because he thinks policy X would be popular with the public at large. It always comes back to the Constitution. So in my view, Washington's model is still within our reach, uh, but this would require a renewed appreciation by all of us, our fellow citizens, of the limits of the presidency and the limits of politics. And, I think, a renewed focus on the importance of character. The American people would also have to be weaned from the politics of passion and embrace Washington's belief in reason. I didn't really touch on that, but in addition to sort of always linking his actions to some constitutional provision. Uh, this is a man who was a firm believer in reason and in moderation, and an opponent of, opponent's too simplistic, but somebody who feared the effect of emotion and passions in politics. And so, uh, for Washington's conception of the presidency to sort of be restored in our political order, his belief in reason, moderation, and it would also require us to understand that for self-government to work, the citizenry must govern themselves and govern their own passions.